the earth will do what is right. So you have a couple of options on that day. You can stand, you can choose to stand there on that day in your own righteousness, hoping that the scale tips in your favor. And millions of people are choosing to do just that, seeking to establish their own righteousness before God. That is, that is moralism, that is religion, that is not the gospel message. The gospel offers us another righteousness, the gift of righteousness, unimputed righteousness that is by faith in Jesus Christ, the very man, by the way, who will be our judge on that day. The righteousness of Christ can clothe and cover us like a royal garment so that on the day of judgment, the judge will be our justifier. And God will view us as he views him on that day. The gospel declares that God loves us by providing a way out from under his wrath and judgment. That way has been provided because the hammer of God's justice has fallen on the Son of God. He became a propitiation for our sin and exposed himself to the terrible wrath and judgment of God on the cross so that those who are in him will never have to face it. Now that is not to say that we won't be judged. And there is, you'll hear this doctrine out there that the judgment day is just for unbelievers. But it says we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But on that day, some will be declared not guilty and will go free. Now before Jesus was taken up into heaven, he said to his disciples there on the mount, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. I have it. God gave it to me. This is the authority that he has to judge the world someday. The Father has given him this authority and this right and placed all things in his hands. One day, the scripture says, he'll sit on his throne in heavenly glory and judge the nations, separating them as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. He's going to do that. How do we know Jesus is going to do that? How do we know Jesus is going to judge the world? How do we know he has this authority? Because he's the one who's been raised from the dead. That's what Paul said in Acts 17. God raised him from the dead, and this is the evidence to all humanity that he is the one who has the authority to judge. He has the keys to death and hell. So who's going to judge the world? Well, look for the man who was raised from the dead. That's the one. That's the one who's going to judge the world. Now he must reign in heaven until all his enemies are put under his feet. So the question is, are you his enemy or his friend? That's the ultimate question. What is your relationship to Christ? That will determine how the day of judgment goes for you. Someday every person in this room will appear before him to be inspected. You see, the day of judgment is kind of like a day of inspection. And there is a standard by which we will be inspected and judged. And it's Jesus. The man, Christ Jesus, is both the standard and the one who will do the inspection. And the only way any of us will pass that inspection is by sheer grace alone. And now we're living in that day of grace. This is the period between his exaltation and this day of final judgment. This is a time when we're called to repent and to believe the gospel. This is the time when the church has been charged with this commission to preach the gospel to to all the nations and then the end will come. This is similar to the time of Noah when the ark was being built. And I tell you, brethren, the flood is coming. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. 
The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage. This is God speaking to Christ. I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. And you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So as we look around the world today, what do we see? We see the the nations raging. We see the kings of the earth setting themselves against the Lord and against his Christ. We see the, the world saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast their courts from us. In other words, we don't want Jesus as our king. We don't want God to rule over us. We want to do what we want to do. Just remember in the light of this, as we read the headlines every day, as we look around at the world, the condition of our world, just remember, like the psalmist said in another place, the feet of the wicked are set in slippery places. We are seeing the nations of the world, including our own nation, attempting to burst his bonds asunder and cast away their cords, And sometimes we might even begin to think that they will be successful in their attempts to rebel against the Lord. But Psalm 2 says, the Lord just laughs. It's not a humorous laugh. It's not that God finds humor in this. It's a laugh of derision. It's a laugh of mocking. God is mocking these little tiny towers of Babel that we keep building. And so God is saying, even to the nations of today, see, I have set my king on Zion. What are you going to do about it, you wicked and rebellious world? The time will come, world, when the Lord's Christ will dash you to pieces like a potter's vessel. It's no wonder the scripture tell us not to love this world. It's destined for destruction. So there's coming a day. When everything that is not reconciled to God through Christ will be completely and eternally destroyed. This includes human souls. Now, I'm not preaching the doctrine of annihilation. And this has become very popular, the idea that people who go to hell will just be annihilated. They will cease to exist. But we believe the scriptures speak very plainly that the wrath of God will be poured out upon the unrepentant and the unregenerate for eternity. And and some people have asked, well, why is that? Why why would God send anyone to hell for eternity? It's because they sinned against the eternal God. That's a serious matter. You see, it's it's not really that serious of a matter. If you sin against me, I would not expect you to be uh, punished for eternity for that. I'm not worth it. But God is. God God deserves to be worshipped forever and ever. And that's why those who refuse to do so will be punished forever and ever. It's not that we take pleasure in talking about this. We, We take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So destroy does not mean annihilate or cease to exist. If, if I told you that my house caught on fire and was destroyed, you, you would never conclude that every molecule of my house somehow went out of existence. That's not what it means. To destroy means to be rendered useless or worthless. On the other hand, saved means to be made useful. To be destroyed is to be thrown out on the garbage heap. And that is hell. To be finally and eternally ruined and thrown away as worthless to the creator of all things. And that's going to happen. So my second question. In light of everything I just said about this coming day of judgment. Who will stand on that day? Can anyone stand? Will anyone pass through the fires of God's judgment? 
Many people today think of the judgment day as something like this, if I could use this image. God is going to bring out his scales of eternal justice. And he will place the weight of your good deeds on one side of his scale and your bad deeds on the other side. And whichever direction the scales tip, that will determine your eternal destiny. And somehow most people believe that the scale will tip in their favor. Nearly everyone is convinced of his inherent goodness. You see, there are two kinds of moralists in the world. There are secular moralists and there are religious moralists. Secular moralists tend to believe in their own inherent goodness and that that will be good enough on the day of judgment. Religious moralists believe in their religious activities and that that will be good enough on the day of judgment. But that is not what the gospel says. Let us just dispense with the idea that the scale will ever tip in our favor that way. There is no one righteous. No, not one. I think he added that in because most, of, most people would say, that's right, there's no one righteous except for me. And the, and the scripture says, not, e- not one, not even you can stand. If we have to stand on that day in our own goodness or morality or religiosity, no one will stand. So what hope do we have? Is there any hope as we anticipate this great day of judgment? Yes, there is hope. Our hope is always in the man Christ Jesus, especially on that final day. And I want to show you how this works by saying the same thing in three different ways. We have hope in Jesus Christ that we can stand on the day of judgment. Those who stand are those who are standing in solidarity with the second Adam. Those who will stand on the day of judgment are those who now are standing in solidarity or union with the second Adam. Note that in his sermon in Athens, Paul said, God has appointed a man A man, the judge of all humanity, is himself a man. From God's perspective, Jesus is the man, the only man, the only man who really counts, the only man who really has his favor, the only man who is really acceptable to him. All of humanity can be represented by two federal heads. Adam and Christ. You can read more details about this in Romans chapter 5. Adam represents that race of man subject to the fall, to sin, and to death. Adam's race has already been cursed and got judged by God. God has already rejected Adam's race. Flesh and blood, Adam's race, cannot, cannot inherit The kingdom of God. But there is a second man. There is a second Adam. There is hope for humanity because in Christ God has started anew. There is a new race of man represented by Christ Jesus. And while Adam's race was marked by sin and death and the judgment of God, the second Adam's race is marked by righteousness and eternal life. So what's going to happen on the day of judgment is God is going to judge everyone by their relationship to these two federal heads, Adam and Christ. If Adam is your federal head, that is, you take after your father Adam primarily, you will be rejected and fall under the wrath of God. In fact, you are already there. But if you are united... Or stand in solidarity. That's what solidarity means. If you stand in solidarity with the second Adam, and if you bear his image, you will be accepted into the eternal kingdom of God. I want to add just a footnote here to this point. We are not preaching that doctrine of what would Jesus do. Or, the, or imitating Christ as the key to standing in the day of judgment. I'm not standing up here and saying, now try really hard to be more and more like Jesus. And when that day of judgment comes, if you're enough like Jesus because you tried really hard, you'll go to heaven. 
That's not how salvation works. This is not about WWJD, what would Jesus do? This is not about imitation, it's about transformation. This is something that God does in us, it's not something we do to ourselves. God is the one. It's actually God's express eternal purpose, Romans 8, to conform us to the image of his son. But that's his work. Now we, we have to cooperate with it, that's true. We have to sanctify ourselves and submit to the Lord, but it's something that he does in light of that day. So who will stand first? Those standing in solidarity with the second Adam. Secondly, a second way to look at this. Who will stand on the day of judgment? Those coming through the designated mediator. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It's already been stated that we need a mediator. We need a priest. We cannot come to God directly. Sin has really caused a gulf between man and God. And so on his own, man is really not acceptable to God. God cannot receive you as you are. You need a mediator. You need a priest. You need an intercessor. But God has made a way for us to come to him acceptably. And we must come by that way that God has ordained and prescribed. If we come any other way, we will be rejected. And the law has illustrated this principle abundantly. Just remember Nadab and Abihu. Offering strange fire leads to death. People today are telling us that there are many ways to come to God. And that is nothing but a lie. There is only one mediator between God and man. There is only one way to come to God, and that's by the man Christ Jesus. A way to the Father has been opened, and it's him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There is no other name by which we must be saved. A way to the Father has been opened, and we dare not seek some other way. We should be thankful that there's a way open at all. This is his grace. He didn't owe us this. And so those who come by that new and living way will stand at the day of judgment. Thirdly, another way to see this, those who stand at the day of judgment will be those wearing the righteousness of Christ. The scripture tells us that the law has shut every mouth and the whole world is standing accountable before God. Now what that means when the scripture says the law is shut every mouth, it means there will be no boasting on that day. Amen. The law has done its work. Our righteousness before God is as filthy rags. Yes. We stand before God like Isaiah and we are undone. We find ourselves like Adam and Eve, naked before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The law has done its work. Every person will have his day in the divine court. And in a sense, because of the law, the, the verdict has already been announced. Guilty as charged. And the penalty is death. And we know the judge of all these. Say that. We'll get into what it actually does say in a few minutes. God intends for his people, his messengers, his preachers to preach about the day of judgment. And the reason why is because Paul says to the Athenians, the times of ignorance are over. Those times when you can be ignorant of God and of this day of judgment, those times are gone. The times have changed and we're living in a new era of redemptive history. There are things that were once hidden or known only to an elect nation, the, the nation of Israel. Those things have now been openly, are being openly declared to the world through the gospel. The times of ignorance are over. No one can claim now and say, I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't know about God. I didn't know I was accountable to God. Times of ignorance have passed. So now, in this time, we are to get ready to meet the Lord. And we're to help others get ready to meet the Lord. 
It's not our business to try to predict when the day of judgment is, is going to come. Our business is to be dressed and ready to meet the master when he comes, whenever it is. And while we wait for him, we are to be faithful doing his work. I believe in our culture today, I believe our situation is actually very similar to Paul's situation in Athens. Remember how Paul began to walk around the city of Athens? He said he saw that the city was full of idols. There was even an idol with this inscription, to an unknown God. And when he began to preach, he started by saying to the Athenians, I see, men of Athens, that in every way you are very religious. Likewise, we live in a religious time. We live in a time when there is a plethora of religious activity, yet the majority of people today are still building altars to unknown gods. People today are ignorant of God. But there is no longer any excuse for this ignorance. This is a time to repent You've been given space to repent, to turn to God before this day of judgment comes. And it's the dark backdrop of the gathering clouds of judgment that makes the gospel shine. That's what makes the gospel good news. You see, the gospel, the go- gospel means good news, but the gospel is also inherently a command. The gospel is not just... Uh, like a news report that you can listen to or maybe not listen to. The gospel is inherently a command. It is a command to repent, to turn away from worthless idols, and to turn to the living God. We know that these are the last days, ever since the day of Pentecost. We're living in the final chapter, if you will, of human history. The time is short. The day of judgment is fast approaching. But we are also living in a time of grace. As long as it lasts, it is possible to repent, to seek the Lord while he may be found, to call on him when he is near. But when the day comes, that space to repent will be over. Paul says the day of judgment has been set or fixed or determined. And God is the one who did that determining. God is the one who has made this appointment. And what God determines is a certainty. Man did not set this day of judgment. God set this day of judgment. And that means nothing can change it. And no one can escape it. All of history is moving toward this day irresistibly like a boat on the water is moved by a heavy current. We're all being swept toward that day. Every individual will have his or her day in the divine court. What an august scene that will be. Some artists have tried to paint it. When the entire race, all those who have ever lived and died, will be gathered together before that great white throne for judgment. It's going to happen. And while many people, both religious and secular, have some kind of notion of a final day of judgment, only the gospel... And only the New Testament scriptures tell us about the nature of that great day. This is not a mystery anymore. We know what that day is about. We are told by Jesus himself and by his apostles that the Son of God will be the final arbiter of God's judgment on that final day. God will judge the world. That's my topic. God will judge the world through Jesus Christ. So now we kind of come to the, the meat of this. And I'm going to ask two questions of this topic. The first question is this. What will happen on the day of judgment? What's going to happen? You know, I I hear a lot of people in the church today talking about the rapture. There's a lot of people talking about the Antichrist. But isn't it strange you seldom hear people talk about the day of judgment? There seems to be little interest in that subject or what will happen on that day. And furthermore, many of the people talking the most about the end times seldom connect that to Jesus or the gospel. What I want to show you briefly 
is that the day of judgment is necessary because of who, because of Jesus and who he is. The day of judgment is necessary because of Jesus and who he is. You see, Jesus has a unique relationship with God, his Father. There's nobody else like Jesus. And the Father, in, in turn, loves his Son. God is pleased with his Son in a way that he is not pleased with anyone else. So the day of judgment is necessary because of this world's rejection of God and his son. God is pleased with his son. This world is not, even to this day. Even though God has exalted Jesus, the world does not acknowledge it. And that is what makes the day of judgment necessary. So what's going to happen on the day of judgment? First... God will vindicate his Christ. God will vindicate his Christ. The last time that Jesus was seen publicly in the world, he was hanging between earth and sky on a cross. Exposed to the world, his own leaders had delivered him up. The Jewish leaders had demanded that the Romans crucify him. Jesus had been mocked, he had been beaten, he had been spit upon, he had been flogged. As he hung there on the cross to add insult to injury, they taunted him by saying things like this, If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And you know what? Jesus never responded to these things. Didn't Isaiah say, as a sheep before the shearers is silent? Why? Why did Jesus not respond? I believe it's because Jesus knew that his father would vindicate him. He didn't have to respond. God would respond in his behalf. Jesus knew that the father would raise him up and exalt him. And so the first part, the first stage, if you will, of God's vindication of Christ was the resurrection. Men rejected and crucified him, but God raised him up. But remember, this is only stage one. Because after he was raised, only his disciples saw him, not the world. Jesus didn't go into the temple and appear after his resurrection. Jesus did not appear before Pilate or the Pharisees. Why? Because there would come a day when the world would see him again. And when he comes, again, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, it will be publicly seen on the day of judgment by the assembled human race that Jesus is the Lord. And all those who mocked him in any age... Or rejected him in any age, or ignored him at any time, or disbelieved in him, will have to bow and confess him as Lord. Now, this has a couple of very direct applications for us, those of us who believe. You see, his vindication will be our vindication as well. His glory, when it's revealed, will be our glory. What did Paul say in Colossians 3? Your life is hid with Christ in God. And when he appears, we also also will appear with him in glory. Like our Lord, those who believe have been rejected by the world, have been mocked, have been taunted. Many of Christ's people have been beaten and tortured and killed by this world. Do you think God has forgotten about that? Remember those souls under the altar in John's revelation? Their cry was for this great day of judgment. And they were told to wait a little longer for the rest of their brethren. And so together we all wait for this time of vindication when the Lord will be revealed from heaven. 
There's another very practical part to this truth for us as believers. Because we know that Jesus will be vindicated and that his vindication will be ours, this sets us free and this enables us to bless those who curse us now and to pray for those who persecute us. That's why we can do that. That's why we can leave ven- vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. So you are set free from having to take vengeance, from having to, to hate anyone. You can, you can be like Stephen. As Stephen was, was dying, he looked up and he saw the exalted Christ. And as he died, he prayed for the forgiveness of his persecutors. Because Stephen knew another day was coming. Amen. So what will happen on the day of judgment? Secondly... God will destroy all opposition to Christ. When he judges the world, he's going to destroy all opposition to Christ. We can only imagine the consternation of the unbeliever on that day. This is not something that is pleasant to talk about. This is going to be a day, Jesus said, of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And if you don't know what gnashing of teeth is... It's simply a, an inarticulate wail or moan of, of anguish. The wicked and the unbeliever will be shut out, thrust out into the outer darkness forever. This day will be a time of unimaginable pain and anguish for the wicked and the unbeliever. That day will be a day when God will pour out his wrath on this present evil world. Right now, this world is storing up wrath for that day like floodwaters building behind a dam. And someday, that pent-up fury of God's wrath will break out and engulf this world. On that terrible day, the world will call for the rocks and the mountains to cover them and hide them from the wrath of God. Or as the book of Revelation says, the wrath of the Lamb but there won't be any place to hide anymore. I believe the words of the second psalm speak prophetically of this day when God will judge and destroy all of the enemies of Christ. I know we know the the words of the second psalm, but permit me to read them here. This is about Christ, remember. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, God will judge the world by the man, Christ Jesus. And there are, there are a couple of passages uh, with this topic. The first is Acts 17.31. Acts 17.31. Because he, that's God, has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The second passage is John 5, verse 22. John 5, 22. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Now, I can think of no thought more arresting, more serious than this thought that God will judge the world. Now, we don't want to give the impression to people that to be a good Christian, you have to be sad or angry all the time or serious all the time. But there is a time for us to be sober and to be serious. And this is one of those subjects that should cause us to be sober-minded. So let's, let's allow this, this truth... And the serious nature of this truth, let's allow that to permeate our minds today. That God is going to judge the world. This should sober even those of us who are at peace with the Lord. Not to mention, not to mention the state of the unbeliever. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The idea of standing before the eternal God for judgment is a heavy consideration for anyone. Our God is a consuming fire. And the only reason someone would not take this seriously is because they don't know very much, if anything, about God. This is a serious subject. The day of judgment is coming. Scriptures tell us this in many, many places. 
and in different ways. One of the things the scripture tells us about that day is it will be a day when many things are going to be revealed. Now there's a lot that's been revealed already, but the day of judgment's like going to be the blinding light of noon. And things are going to be brought out of the closet. And things are going to be known that are now hidden. One thing that's going to be made known is the very subject of this renewal. The glory of the exalted Christ is going to be made known on the day of judgment. With that revelation will be the glory of his church. The revelation of his people goes along with this as well. When he's revealed, we'll be revealed. Jesus said the secrets of men's hearts will be laid bare on that day. And there's a sense in which this judgment day has already begun in a sort of a preliminary way. You see, when Jesus came into the world, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And his, just his very presence in the world is, in a sense, the beginning of this day of judgment. The light began to pierce the darkness, and the very presence of light is a kind of judgment on the darkness this is a serious, sobering topic. It's a topic that the world today, our culture, wants to ignore. The church wants to ignore this topic, actually. It's not popular today to talk about judgment. We're told that we are to be tolerant, not judgmental. The popular idea of a loving God does not seem to fit with the idea of a day of judgment. And so what has happened today is the modern church, the modern institutional church, not the true church of God, but the, the institutional church has decided that if we want to be accepted by the world, we're not going to preach about the day of judgment. And so they've stopped declaring this truth. Because the masses today want to hear about love and tolerance and acceptance, not hellfire and brimstone. And this is not being preached today. You see, to judge means to exclude. To judge means to reject, to condemn. And none of those things are politically correct. In fact, they're often called hate speech. And so in this culture, you probably aren't going to create a mega church by preaching about the day of judgment. And so many people, even in the church, have chosen to reject divine revelation and have opted for man's wisdom. And what we have today is the, the doctrine of universalism has become very popular, even in the church. If you don't know what the word universalism means, it's the belief that everyone's going to be saved. No one's going to be condemned. And this has gained a lot of popularity, even in the church. It's a doctrine that is very convenient it fits the spirit of the age. And I'm, I'm not a prophet, but I believe our society will continue to put more and more pressure on the church to adopt a position of tolerance and not talk about judgment. And we will see, I predict, we will see more and more churches and preachers and whole denominations conform to the spirit of the age rather than be marginalized by popular culture. It's already happening. So when we talk about the day of judgment, we're talking about a great ideological battleground. Does God really judge? Does God really reject certain kinds of people and accept others? Even the very thought of that is offensive to many people. Doesn't God just accept everybody? Doesn't he just love and accept Everyone. What is more, we're being told by the intelligentsia of our culture that religion is the thing behind all of the strife and enmity in the world. You see, if the, we are told something like this. If we could just accept one another and not judge, then we would have a peaceful and united world. That's what they believe. It's religion that divides us, they say. The, the belief that God accepts some and rejects others. So this is controversial today. In spite of all of that controversy, we cannot escape the necessity of judgment. 
In fact, in rejecting the idea of judgment, a kind of judgment is being made. In fact, it's not uncommon for Christian people to be judged for being judgmental. Actually, we cannot think and we cannot live every day of our lives without making judgments about many things. For example, Americans are people who love justice. I don't know if you've been watching the news, but there's been a couple of very disturbing news stories about the man at Penn State, a sexual predator, young boy with an arsenal of weapons goes into a movie theater for no reason. And Americans are outraged. And the judgments begin coming down on these, these evil people who would do these horrible things. Some of these are the same people that would turn around and reject the idea of God judging. So on one hand, we reject in our culture the idea of a judgmental God. But on the other hand, we bemoan all of the evils and injustices in the world today. You can't have it both ways. We make judgments. And when people make judgments like that, when we condemn a sexual predator, predator, when we condemn a murderer, we are in fact calling for a day of judgment. We are acknowledging that there is such a thing as justice. The only thing they're not acknowledging is where that idea comes from. The fact is, is that God has put a conscience in every person that conscience is an innate sense, a knowledge. In fact, conscience is, is conscience, with knowledge. That's what the word means. It's an innate sense or knowledge of right and wrong. It's universal. That's why Paul could say in Romans that all men are without excuse. People really do know what is right. They just choose when it's convenient to ignore it. And so while people often bemoan the so-called human conditions, the human condition and all of the evils out there in the world, they at the same time find ways to rationalize their own behavior. People try to cover their nakedness before God in a thousand different ways, even with religion. Because the very idea that there is an omniscient deity who sees us completely, before whom everything is laid bare, that is an unnerving thought. But when we come to the scriptures, we come face to face with the reality of God and of our ultimate accountability to God. Now it's interesting to me to note that Paul said these words. Paul said this, he, that is God, has fixed a day on which he will judge the world. You know who Paul said that to? He said that to a group of Greek philosophers. He said that to a group of highly intellectual, educated people. He said that to a group of people steeped in the wisdom of this world. Paul, on the other hand, was a man steeped in Scripture. And while it's been noticed, it's been noticed in Acts 17, that Paul doesn't directly quote a passage of Scripture to the Athenians. Everything he says in his sermon in Acts 17 is based on the teaching of Scripture. And I believe Paul may have been thinking about what the prophets called, when Paul says that God has fixed today in which he will judge the world, I think Paul may have had in his mind what the old prophets called the day of the Lord. The old Hebrew prophets predicted the coming of the day of the Lord when God would come down to judge and administer justice on the earth. For behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger in fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh and those slain by the Lord... Yes, this is in the Bible. Those slain by the Lord shall be many. Isaiah 66, 15 and 16. For the day is near. The day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. Ezekiel 30, verse 3. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. 
Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. Let me just pause and explain what this image really means. How do you get grape juice or wine? You get it by crushing grapes. In the old times, they would throw the grapes into a vat called a wine press, and they would stomp the grapes out. This is a violent image of God literally stomping the nations of the world under his feet, as it were. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. Joel 3, 13 through 15. So when Paul has the opportunity to preach the gospel in Athens on Mars Hill, and I do believe he preached the gospel that day, although you will read scholars that say that he didn't, that he preached a different message, but I I believe Paul preached the gospel, and when he preached the gospel there in Athens, he preached about the day of judgment. Far from being opposed to the gospel, the day of judgment is a crucial aspect of the gospel. And this is something that has to be preached today if we are going to be faithful ministers of the gospel. Let's be clear. The gospel does not say God loves everyone and therefore there's no reason to fear his wrath. The gospel does not 